joyously and joyfully brought chaos wherever they went and helped to turn the Beano into one of the most successful comics of the time. In Bash Street Unplugged, Leo Baxendale returns to Preston to explain how and why the Bash Street kids came to be and why Plug, Fatty, Smithy and the rest were like nothing else in schoolboy or schoolgirl fiction. I sent my first pencil sketch, the embryo, the, my idea for Bash Street, to the Beano in January 1953. I was looking for a national market for my work, but the response of the managing editor was offhand. I don't think he realised what I was up to, and it was very different from what they were doing in the Beano at the time, which was full of magic. And it was only after I created Little Plum in April of that year, and then Minnie the Minx in September of 53, that they came back to me and asked me to go ahead with Bash Street and George Mooney, the editor of the Beano, came down to Preston from Dundee on the 20th of October, 1953. I will never forget the date because it was exactly a week before my 23rd birthday and over a pot of tea in the Cardoma Cafe, he asked me to go ahead with Bay Street. I saw him off on the train. I was walking on there. I walked back down Fishergate, which is the main dead straight shopping street in Preston. And by the time I reached the other end of Fishergate to catch my bus, I thought of all the gags and comic sequences for that first back street. Got home, started drawing it immediately that evening. I was drawing these first back streets, minis and plums, on the dining room table. The problem was, of course, that when it was time for my mother to lay the tea for the family, because I was the oldest of a large family, I had to clear my drawing implements and drawings off the table and wait until the family was finished and then start again. I'm Leo Baxendale and I've come back to Preston to retrace my steps 40 years ago uh, when I thought of the first Bash Street drawing while walking along Fishergate here in Preston. We're going to end up at the Harris Museum, one of my haunts at the time. We're starting here at Preston Railway Station because this is where I saw Beano editor George Mooney off 40 years ago after we discussed the birth of Bash Street. <laughs> We've walked up from the railway station to Fishergut proper and we're outside the Cardoma Cafe where George and I talked about the birth of Bash Street. The Cardoma Cafe is long gone, it's now a building society and much else has changed in Fishergut. At that time it was a crowded, non-pedestrianised 1950 street and on a normal day I would have been accosted by a street photographer, quite a few of them from the time. I always walk very fast, but on that day after, in 1953, after I'd left George Moon at the, at the station, I was anxious to get on with the Bash Street drawing, and I was striding along Fishergut, which is a long, long, dead straight street, so I, there was no way I, I would have been accosted. I was deep in thought, and my mind was working fast. George had told me that he would like a winter scene for the first by street because he planned to put it into the Beano just after Christmas so within my first few steps I thought right winter scene 
snow and ice, I'll have a frozen pond that will give me a closely bound composition where I can have the kids in either foreground or close middle foreground. And it will also give me a common theme for ideas. And with each step that I took along Fishergut, the mind works very fast in these uh, circumstances. And I thought of, I would have a, an army in that first set of 50 or 60 kids, half girls, half boys, just like the Beano readership. And I was working with a composition from left to right, as one normally does, to, because it's, that's the natural way for the eye to follow. And because it was a frozen pond, the, 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 the gags, the comic sequences, the disasters, the um, ice hockey, boys versus girls, plenty of scope for disasters and mayhem and mild malizings, the ice speed skating, the stunts, the kids digging dangerous holes in the ice, and so on and so on. One child with a saw thoughtfully uh, cutting through the ice right round the pond, uh, the ultimate disaster. All these were taking place within a composition of worlds of action from left to right and coming round spiralling on itself and, and in the foreground you had the leaders, the two readers bang up in the foreground uh, of Toots and Danny. Come on and skate Grandad, don't be shy. Penny, buy Toots ice lollies, milk on flavour, only a penny. I wanted to do uninhibited comedy, completely uninhibited. And I thought of the Bash Street kids as completely uninhibited beings. They were gormless and they lived in a world of uncertainty so that what they set out to do could come to disaster or more likely the world around them would, would, would uh, fall to bits under the trampling hooves. But they were joyous beings and it was a different world from example what had gone on before in, in the older comics like the world of Billy Bunter for example where there was bullying and japes and jokes and, and so on and I didn't believe in that world I, I, I didn't believe in practical jokes because I think they diminish people and there was no bullying in Bash Street and, and the, the name Bash Street which I thought of for the school was in misnomer in that there was, they didn't bash each other or anybody else what they did was they lived in a surreal world where they went out into the world and they would sink battleships. Oh dear, did it cost a lot. And they would blow up the school and they would drive the teachers, who were equally surreal beings, beyond the brink of dementia. And the entire world would fall to bits around them and they would burst out, out into that world with, with complete confidence and joy. And apart from that, of course, the whole point, from my point of view, of this uninhibited comedy was, first of all, to make me burst out laughing when I thought of a good idea. And then when I, when I sent or took the drawing into the Beano, the Beano staff journalists would roar with laughter, and then the millions of Beano readers would roar with laughter, and, and the fan mail would come in. And the fan mail was wonderful. It was full of passion. The drawings I did were full of passion. I put an enormous intensity, a great intensity into them. And then there was passion came back in the form of the letters. One very early letter from a small girl responding to something on the first ten bash streets. She wrote in and said, I love, love, love the Bash Street kids pulling those horrible faces. And the, the readers drew drawings in the margins of the letters. I mean, obviously, they were inspired by my characters, the Bash Street kids and Minnie and Plum. And yet, they were all drawn in their own distinctive individual styles. Uh, because I do believe that, that all children are born with the potential for great creativity. And it was fascinating that what I did in the Bean, though, could arouse such passion that it would, it would cause them to do these wonderful drawings that we sent to us, to the Beano. They're really naughty and they're, they're always telling the teachers to shut up and that, and like, they always like getting into trouble, they, they don't mind. They always take me out of the teachers. They're naughty, they're always naughty, like they're never good. <laughs> they don't, on the other people, that. they're just like, yeah, they're just naughty. Silly. We don't do all the things what they do. But we do some. We, mess we don't lock up teachers. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could, though, but like. <laughs> Sometimes they do it, somebody. Like, there's that 
plug. He does. He goes, woo -hoo. And fat kid, he does. <laughs> fat, fat kid. kid. That's why I call him. Fat boys in comics, and when I came to create Dice Street and Plumbing and the rest in 53, because I was a professional artist and working in cartoons, I knew what had gone on right back into the previous century, and I knew that fat boys in comics, like Bunter uh, in Magnet and Gemma and Hungry Horace in The Dandy, were objects of fun, and they were always portrayed as stuffing themselves. Well, I never drew Fatty stuffing himself at all. He wasn't there either as a butt of jokes. In fact, if anybody had tried to take advantage of Fatty, he'd have got flattened, because essentially he was a human steamroller. I created Fatty as, as a shape, in the, in the same way that I created Plug as a, as a, as a tall telegraph pole to make a, a visual difference from all these other kids. Fatty was a round object, and his weight came in very handy for all kinds of gags, for flattening purposes, because in Bastard, of course, people did get flattened. And, and that was the essence of, of Fatty's uh, personality. If you looked at the back streets that drew Fatty, nobody messed with Fatty. When I created Little Plum and Minnie the Minx and Bash Street in 1953, I was sending the drawings up from Preston to the Beano office in Dundee. And I started getting these worried letters back from the editor who, who was worried about crime and punishment. And I did notice that in the existing Beano, Dennis was whacked at the end of every episode for being naughty. But that kind of thing was alien to me, to my being. In fact, it was hostile to the idea of characters either being rewarded or punished for any of their actions. I, I was creating a world of uninhibited beings, a, a world of the unforeseen, where punishment for actions didn't come into it. It was, it was a world of unforeseen disasters coming out of the blue. The other thing that was a persistent theme in Bash Street was that, uh, and I think a typical example of my dealing with crime and punishment would be the school doctor Bash Street in 1960, where you began with an overweening, overbearing authority figure in the, in the shape of the school doctor, who was determined to deal with these Bash Street kids and, and put them to rights. And as you go through the strip, you can see his gradual physical and psychological destruction. And that was typical of the Bash Street kids. And to go with that, the very first Bash Street and the first half dozen Bash Streets I did, I drew the kids with layers of intent, a bit like Dennis, so you could see their in intent on deliberate mayhem and marmalising. But really when you consider that when I first created Bash Street, I'd had in mind the herds of stampeding bison in Little Plum, so they went out in the world and trampled it underfoot. But it was without, without deliberate malice, so I started to give them beaming smiles. So the marmalising and tramplings and large-scale disasters and the destructions of authority figures continued unabated, but you couldn't tell from the beaming smiles of the kids whether it was deliberate or just happenstance. And that was an ambiguity in the comedy which seemed to make it all the funnier. When I completed the first Bash Street drawing, the frozen pond number, something odd happened. George Mooney asked me to put a line of policemen in the background, just marching up uh, to keep the, keep the kids in order. I, I found that very odd. I actually did draw them right in the background. They weren't doing anything, they were just marching up with truncheons drawn. But then, two or three weeks later, I, I, I was doing a Bash Street and, and I had a scribbled note from George saying, would you mind... It was a nightclub scene that the kids had made on a nightclub. He said, would you mind introducing some policemen to keep the kids in order? So here it was again. This wasn't, it wasn't part of my being. I was a bit dubious, so what I did was I actually had the policemen in the, night, the nightclub number marching up with weaponry, armed, and I had the kids preparing to repel them with all kinds of fiendish booby traps. And I sent it off to Dundee and got a very worried letter back from George saying, we can't really suggest to readers that the police are armed and that the police are open to assault my kids. So I sat and thought about this and I, I took the police out of that number. I thought, well, this won't do. I, I can't have the police in, in Bash Street. They're not part of my ethos. I can't be messed about in this way. And they disappear forever. And ironically, it was that disappearing of the police from Bash Street that caused me to need a foil for the Bash Street kids. And thus I began to make the teachers the protagonists of the Bash Street kids and it was then over the first few months that I started off with a group of teachers and then began to narrow it down to one teacher and it ended up as the teacher, the man with no name. Smithy's in a bad way. He's got spots and pimples from gobbling too many sweets. 
Puts your eyeballs through reading the bin or under the bedclothes at night. And a furry tongue from sucking too many lollipops. Now then, children, there's a doctor coming to give you weeds a medical examination today. Oh, no! Meanwhile, at the hospital... Oh, these Bash Street kids ain't so tough. I've got a little surprise for them. The doctor uses the headmaster's study as a surgery, and first in is plug. Aha! First victim. Step right this way, my boy. I gave him his name, Plug, from the phrase Plug Ugly. And the thing about Plug was that he got his looks from his mum because his dad was a raving beauty. And in later years, I did have people who read the Beano in, in, in the 50s and 60s writing to me when they were adults, worriedly asking if I based Plug on them. <laughs> but uh, the thing about him was that despite his ugliness, he, he was so full of radiant self-confidence in himself. He, he knew he was destined that when he grew up, of course the Bastikas could never grow up, but nevertheless, nevertheless, in his own mind he would grow up to be a famous rock star or whatever. And in fact, in, when was it, 1961, I think I did a, a Bash Street Panto number where uh, Plug was a sleeping beauty. And I think the self-satisfied, complacent smirk on his face as a sleeping beauty summed up Plug. I mean, in his own mind, he was born a radiant being. Step right this way, my boy. I'm going to test your reflexes. But the doctor soon discovers that Plug's reflexes are working OK. Ow! Next into the surgery is Herbert. You who Doctor, where are you? You've got to test my eyes. I'm right in front of you, you nit. Now read me the letters on that chart. That chart there on the wall. What wall? I'm not sure whether you're short-sighted or half-witted. Send the next pupil in as you go out. And that's the fireplace, not the door. Next came Danny. I'll examine your tonsils, lad. Say, ah. <clears throat> ah, let go of my finger. In mind very much somebody modelled on the William of Rick McCrompton's William books, but because this was a comic, the Beano, not, not a book, I needed something extra. So I stuck a, a pirate flag on his chest, the uh, Skull and Crossbones of Jolly Roger, and thus, of course, I got his name, Death Said Danny, and, and he became just Danny. Now, with Toots, his co-leader, I had a problem. It was only a few weeks since I created Minnie and the Minx, so I didn't want to have Toots like Minnie, so I had to differentiate them. And I thought, well... Toots is a leader. Uh, she's one of the two marmalizers in chief of the Bash Street Kids, Danny and Toots. I'll model her on Bodhi Seer. And in fact, she had a, a chariot drawn by some small unfortunate. And she was the leader of men and women. By contrast, Minnie was leader of nobody. She act, always acted alone. You had this group of kids with a strong sense of camaraderie. And they were obviously always together. Even in a picture where one of the kids was up in the foreground doing what was required to bring the storyline along. You can see in, the, in not too far away in the background some of his or her mates, some, some mayhem, and it was always this. Whereas, mainly, Minnie was in the frame by herself unless she was engaging struggle with somebody or something. Minnie's having a boring day at school until an arrow arrives through the window. Whoa, a message from the boys at Sword School. We'll get you after school, Minnie. Crumbs, I don't have any weapons with me. I'd better be on my guard. And later, when Minnie turns into her own street. Get Minnie now, aren't we? I'll use my catapult and we'll try and corner her in her own street. Crumbs, there's loads of them, and they're using mechanised warfare. Armoured carts, dustbin lids, the lot. I need some heavyweight help. <laughs> Mr. Smith won't mind me borrowing his garden roller for a bit. Huh, they won't catch me off my guard. And sure enough, the sludge school kids are powerless to reduce Minnie's roller. They got completely marmalised.
we've ended up here in the Harris Art Gallery and Museum because in the Second World War it was one of our great haunts. And indeed, in the early 50s, at the time I created Bash Street, during the war, I and some of my uh, classmates came in here to the reference library, the Lending Library, and the art galleries, and plotted ambitious plans for the future. <laughs> during the Second World War, I spent my grammar school years at the Preston Catholic College, which was at the railway station end of Fishergut. And coming home each day, I would, I would use the Harris as a staging post, the tranquility, all the ideas in here, the, the drawings, the paintings, the books. Mind you, after the German invasion of Norway in 1941, the newsprint was rationed, so there weren't many new books in the library here. Although, it wasn't so much that, it was a uh, this wonderful place, so roomy, so quiet, where you could sit and think and let your brain float about. And that was where it had a, a, a direct link to the Beano in that creating work like Mini Links and the Bash Street Kids and Plum and so on is very much a matter of letting your brain roam free. The place is full of drawings and paintings from over the centuries. And at first glance, the art I created for the Beano seemed at a great distance from the works in here. But when I created by street and the rest for the Beano, we built up the circulation from about 400,000 copies a week to 2 million copies a week by the late 50s. To do that, we had to cover all the classes, and we had children, teenagers, adults, every, everybody. And there was something else which I didn't know at the time. I was only told about this 20 years later by Donald Ruin, a cartoonist who was actually at art school at Bradford with David Hockney in 53, the year I created Bash Street. And he told me that in the 50s, the art schools became aware of Bash Street. And because they didn't know my name, because they didn't sign the drawings, they called me the master of Bash Street. And it's intriguing to think that here was my work going out into the world, not only to every class of person, adults and children and so on, but all these art students were reading my work and absorbing it in one way or another. Because artists don't live alone in history, they're all part of the history. I was part of my history. I took diverse sources into my work, mainly radio, I must say, radio or comedy, all kinds of material that in its turn becomes synthesised into your work. You're, in di you're a different person in history, a different time, and you're always working within your history and working on the work of others before you. And here, unknown to me, in my turn, other people were absorbing the ethos of my work. And it isn't so much that artists take directly from each other or from their predecessors in history, it somehow becomes part of their attitude to life and it affects their, their stance in life and, in, in, and thus it affects their art. And what you do and what others do gets passed on in this way. It's, it's a thrilling thing and it's in quite large part unforeseen. The grammar school I went to during the Second World War was a Jesuit college. So that obviously not like Bash Street at all. It, it, it was grounded in history, but not the real, li real everyday life of history. All artists live within history, and all artists, when you begin your careers, are very, very conscious of what has been successful in your field. And I had been very conscious, just before I created, just before 53, when I created Mini Plum and Bash Street, of the success of the very uninhibited comedy of The Goons on radio and Tony Hancock on radio, and so on. That, that's interesting, because I was drawing, I was doing a visual comedy, and my antecedents were a really sound comedy, uh, Tony Hancock and the Goons and so on. And in the visual field, the very zany Warner Brothers um, animated cartoons I've seen at the cinema during the Second World War, Daffy Duck and the Bunny and so on. Bash Street School appeared to be much nearer to reality than what had gone before in comics, and as well as that, I did develop a drawing style that was very three-dimensional. You could feel the woomph when the bodies collided. It was very intense, and yet it was illusion because there was no school in real life and no kids in real life like that. It was much, much larger than life, so it was an illusion. I was vaguely aware that there were secondary moderns by then, <laughs> as well as the grammar school I'd, grammar school that I'd been to. So I deliberately blurred the distinction the Bay Street kids are made of secondary school pupils, but it wasn't obvious what kind of school it was. They wore ordinary clothes. The teachers wore motorboard and, and, and gown. That was really to put a big black splodge on the page, because it, these were letterpress printed comics, and I put solid black trousers on the kids and, and motorboards and capes on the teachers. 
But also I was blurring the distinction. You couldn't really tell whether it was a grammar school or a secondary one and something in between, some bizarre alternative. Once you've introduced the character into, um, in, into the set, into the by street, and as the weeks go by, you're always building on what you've done before. Because, I mean, obviously, you don't create everything on one day, and you've, you have all the energies of each day working. You know, you go to bed, you eat, you, you wake up refreshed, you have fresh thoughts. You're always building on what's gone before. You always have realizations suddenly what you can do. And there comes a point quite rapidly when you've introduced the, the characters into the set, and they appear week after week, where somehow or other, plot by plot, week by week, you know, happening by happening, did they all develop their own individual personalities in detail. And that is, of course, the product of, of countless acts of judgment, of creative judgment, as you're drawing them week after week, month after month. And there comes a point quite rapidly where you can't mess about with them. They, all, they have their distinct identities and personalities, and you can't transpose them. You can't have Smithy acting as if he was Wilfred or Plug acting as if he was Fatty. It, it, that in a set, that passage out of your control, so you have to observe them, even though they are surreal, fictional characters, you have to observe them as if they were real people with a real history and real personalities, and you can't mess them about. Come on and skate, Grandad! Don't be shy! As you're actually drawing that individual character, you, you invest all of your being into that character, and then you go on to the next one, so in, in a sense, it's like a very large and unruly family of children that you've, you've born, uh, and uh, you can't pick a favourite. It would be an impossible thing for me to do. Bash Street Unplugged was presented by Leo Baxendale. Thanks are due to the staff and pupils at Preston St Peter's and Eldon Street Primary Schools and to the intercity staff at Preston. The programme was produced in Bristol by John Byrne.